Hi guys, welcome to another short video by Antiques Arena. My name is Walter O'Neill. In this video I'm going to do a small chart on Powell and Sons, uh, who later became Whitefriars Glass. Um, I'm going to um, do a little, very, very brief history on the uh, company. I'm going to show you a couple of examples I have in front of me, and then I'm going to go over to books that are absolutely amazing. So whether you're an up-and-coming antique dealer, or whether you're a collector, or whether you just love the glass, um, these books will help you. Whitefriars glass of late is being reproduced. Certainly they're, um, they're more desirable pieces. Um, they've done pieces, drunken bricklayer, um, the hooped vase and things like that. And because these are all demanding so much money, they are being faked. So you need your books um, to help you with identification. There are sites that can help you identify the difference from a fake to a real. But in all honesty, once you familiarize yourself with Whitefriars Glass and you read the books and you, you handle it enough, you will know the difference between the fake and the real. So, I'll um, I'll get to uh, showing you some of the pieces on that, and um, we'll go from there. Now, James Powell started the um, Powell and Sons um, Glassworks in the 1830s. He was originally a wine merchant. Um, he died um, in 1840, leaving the business to his three sons. Now they were originally doing um, trade glasswares in lighting connectors and small panes of panels of glass for windows um, and they later moved into table glassware as in glasses and decanters and then into decorative. Now by the time of the Great Exhibition in 1851 uh, when they exhibited some of their pieces they had serious success and their business started skyrocketing from there. By the exhibition of 1860s, um, Whitefriars, um, or Powell and Sons as they were then, um, had the biggest or the greatest display uh, in their category. Um, they, they moved on into more and more decorative pieces. Um, when I show you in the book now, some of their works was absolutely spectacular. Uh, by 1919, they introduced Whitefriars, or the name Whitefriars. So it was originally James Powell, uh, sorry, Powell and Son, uh, in brackets, Whitefriars. So they could operate under that name. Um, now we know them just as Whitefriars Glass. Um, I believe they ceased in 1980. Um, some of their pieces from the 60s is absolutely spectacular and seriously does pull good money. Back um, a few years ago, I did mention on another video, back a few years ago, probably about 10 years ago, before Whitefriars really started being collectible, I used to see it everywhere on car boot sales. I'd buy a coffin vase for a pound and sell it for 10 or 20. Um, but I went to Kempton Racecourse with a friend of mine and we, he went one direction, I went the other. And a dealer turned up and he had Whitefriars vases, and these weren't standard vases, he had the giant ones. And he had four, or five, six of them, all the different colours, um, and he wanted £50 each for them. And I was having an R, and it was very early um, in when I was doing the antiques, I didn't been going a few years, and I was unsure. It was quite a bit of money, it was a few hundred pounds, I hadn't gone with a lot, I went with about five, six hundred pounds to Kempton that day. And it was a big chunk to put into something, and to be honest with you, I felt I was buying it all the time at car boot sales. Granted I wasn't buying the large lumps, but I was buying the smaller pieces for a pound or two. And they weren't really flying out. Um, within the 12 month, um, those vases were a thousand pounds each. So that was really one of my big mistakes of uh, all time. I left probably four or five thousand pounds worth there for a few hundred pounds. So even to this day, I still remember them. But then I've had times where I bought, I was at a car boot sale with my mother, 
and I was there and the lady pulled out a, a 14, 12, 14 inch glass vase and it had a couple of raised rings around the base or a, a third way up of the base and I bought it, it was £2, put it on eBay, didn't, weren't 100% what it was uh, once I'd done my research I realised it was a hooped vase, white rice hooped vase and I sold that for £2,500 so swings and roundabouts I suppose, I lost on one end and gained on another but Whitefriars glass is certainly one of the, well, the 20th century uh, glass is certainly some of the most collected glass out there now. So I'll show you a couple of pieces I have and I'm going to show you in uh, the box. Um, hope you find the short video interesting um, and hopefully the box will help you. I'll give you the ISBN so you can order the box should you want them. And um, we'll go from there. Okay, I'm going to start with this book now. And this is a seriously comprehensive book. Um, it has their full history, and I mean down to the last everything. Here's the ISBN. There you go. Go to the index page. Now, this page was done by the Museum of London. Uh, this book was produced either in con connection with the Museum of London or by the Museum of London. Um, covers absolutely everything, the history, uh, when it began, all the way through the Joblin London Glass House there from 1834 to 1870. Um, all the history, covers examples of their works. I'm going to show you in a few minutes. Oh. Uh, I'll talk to you in a minute about um, their decanters and their drinking glasses. Here's a couple of examples of their early window panels, um, which is some of their early ways. As you can see, some of this stuff is spectacular. Look at that. That is absolutely amazing. It's all etched spectacular you'd look at that and you'd think that's a Georgian piece of glass absolutely beautiful so it's as you can see some amazing works uh, as power glass you can't really uh, question it look at that that's as good as anything you'll ever see um, and I would imagine that's in the thousands As you can see, the book is very comprehensive. Now we get to a section I wanted to mention. Um, now I've done a video on 18th century drinking glasses. Um, showed some cotton twists, some air twists, um, and other versions. Now, white is here, you see, if I zoom in here, you can see the cotton twist in the stem, and there, and you have the air twist in this glass here. So then you have the problem then when you're buying the drinking glasses at the car boot sale. The problem you have are these Georgian drinking glasses then or are they white fryers? So the problem you have is do you pay, if you uh, want to collect them, do you pay good money for a glass when you're not sure? Because I can assure you the Powell and Sons drinking glasses are almost identical to the Georgian glasses. So, very hard. So you need to familiarise yourself with 18th century drinking glasses if that's what you want to deal in. Well, in addition to that, I'm skip forward a few pages here. I took more a page on decanters. Now what we have here is it what's known as a mercurial step cut decanter. Now this would be a typical Georgian decanter. All of these, to be totally honest with you, are in a much earlier style. And if you see these on a car boot sale or an antique fair, you would be very hard pressed to know if these were Georgian or white fryers. Um, either way, they're going to be worth money. So if you're buying at a car boot sale, doesn't matter. But I can assure you now, 
a mercurial step cut decanter, Georgian one, it's going to be up under £150. Um, and that's selling it on eBay. If you're a specialist dealer, you can be up four or five hundred pound. Um, so you got you got to be very careful there. As you can see, I'm flicking through. Here we have a few examples. You have your anomaly streaky vase, um, a drunken bricklayer. This book really does cover everything. You have the paperweights. A lot of the paperweights, what you're looking for is inside the Mili Fiori, you'll find the Whitefriars cane, or you'll find the monk in a cane, which tells you it's Whitefriars. As I say, this book is as in depth or comprehensive as uh, anything you want. It tells you everything from their profits, their stock, uh, absolutely everything. It shows you all the pattern books. You, I don't think you'll find a better book out there on Whitefriars glass. Um, you come across your even shows you the marks. Joseph Powell and Son Mark comes in then. There's your Whitefriars monk and there. So it covers this book seriously does cover absolutely everything come across now you have all the different patterns for the decanters, the, the glasses, the lighting as you can see then you move into the more decorative now, now you are in Whitefriars in the 30s and you keep going forward now we're up to the drunken brick layer and the tango vases and everything else Got the Greek key pattern there. You got the bark by Je Jeffrey Baxter. There's there's lots of um, information. This book seriously is an in-depth history and biography of Powell Glass and Whitefriars. The next book I'm going to show you is by Leslie Jackson. This is Whitefriars Glass. Again, you'll have the history um, all the way from 1830s right the way through to 1918 before it became Whitefriars. Uh, one thing this book does have that the other doesn't is a lot more color coloured illustrations. But again, full of illustrations of their works, absolutely stunning works. Not as comprehensive as the other, but if um, the book is just as good, um, it gives you everything you need to know. And then you come up into the coloured illustrations, and these coloured illustrations are very helpful. Now we start coming into the area you're going to start seeing at car boot sales. These ribbed vases here, I see them re quite regular. They don't pull fortunes, £30, but you will see them. Um, as you can see, there's lots of coloured illustrations. As I carry on flicking through the book, you can see the diverse range of uh, Whitefriars glasses produced. Um, some of their ex experimental ways. Um, to be honest with you, you could pick a piece up and not even know it's Whitefriars. These optical uh, ribbed ones, I've had those quite a bit. Um, so. As you can see, the book really does give you an in-depth look into Whitefriars. Now you come across your lobed vases. Um, we have where are we? Is it small lobed bowl there? Um, now I'm going to show you a lobed bowl in just a moment, um, and I'm going to come back to this page because there's a vase here. I'm going to discuss with you in just a moment. You can see basically 
Um, well, the ranges they do are absolutely unbelievable. Now we're coming into what is pretty much some of the dearest white rice glass. These ones here, these are going to be the large ones I talked about that I left at the antique fair. And they come in a giant size. And they're up over a thousand pound a piece. Here we have the hoop vase I talked to you about earlier, where I mentioned I bought a vase and sold out for a couple of hundred pound. Um, that's them, you'll see the hooping around the base there. Um, you have the knobbly and streaky range up here. Uh, a lot of this stuff is di designed by Jeffrey Baxter in the 60s. And some of this really does pull some good money. Here we have the drunken bricklayer. It is one of the rarest vases and also at the same time, now because of the money they pull, one of the most faked. There are sites you can find that will help you um, how to identify real uh, Whitefriars glass. I'm not a specialist in Whitefriars. I've got the books and I buy it if I see it. Um, do I make mistakes? Yes. It happens. Um, but I don't pay enough money that it matters. So if you're going to go specialist, I suggest you get the books and you read the books and then you find the sites that concentrate purely on how to identify the pieces. So I'm going to give you the ISBN of this book now. If I can just get it. There you go, this is the ISBN. And now I'm going to give you a little look at the pieces of glass I have here today. Down there. Now, here we have a small bowl. It's a lobed bowl. I always called them a molar. Um, I don't know if that's the correct name or not, because they always resemble a tooth. Now it has the polished pontle. I don't know if you can see that yet. That indentation is always on white fryers. Um, that's where they snap it off the rod, and as a sign of quality, they always polished it smooth. It's heavy. White fryers is always heavy. And these bubbles, they're not random, they are controlled. Um, so you have a nice little piece of white fries here. That's a 20, 30 pound little bowl. It's not a fortunes. Now, we have a bowl here with the bubbles and everything. It's just a tall, straight bowl. Now, what it's trying to be is one of these here. Um, now, they do the colour, the colour the color isn't unheard of, however, this, this vase is a period piece. It is a piece from the 50s or 60s, and it does have a polished pontal with plenty of wear around the base. However, I believe this vase to be a Scandinavian uh, example. Look how thin the body is. And if this had been white fries, it would have been considerably thicker. There'd have been a lot more control to the uh, bubbles, a lot more control, a lot more quality in the piece. Um, it is a period piece, but I do believe it's trying to be white fries or copy in their manner. So you really do need to know um, your glass. The books will help. As I said, the books will help you in learning their patterns, their styles, their shapes, their colours. Um, but the only way to learn the actual feel of the glass is by handling it. Um, so go to antique fairs. Whitefriars glass is on 5 out of 10 stalls. So pick it up, handle it, talk to the dealers, read the descriptions, learn the weight of the pieces and the feel. Um, it used to be a regular stable diet for me, white fryers. I used to buy it regular. Um, as I said, I'd buy a coffin vase or just a, a bark vase for a pound or two at a car boot sale and I'd sell them on almost every week. Um, I haven't seen a piece of white fries on a car boot sale now for three, three and a half years. Unless it's been on a dealer's stall. So, it will come up. And when it does, you will make a lot of money on it. However, 
you need to know the um, you need to know the white fryers when you see it. The books are well worth investing in. I always recommend books to um, people whether you want to learn um, to collect the pieces, whether you want to learn to deal it, or whether you just want to further your education. Two very good books here. They're not going to be cheap books. Um, I'd imagine you're talking probably £50 plus for the uh, museum book and probably £30, £40 for the Leslie Jackson edition and that's just an estimate guess. I haven't looked. But I'm sure you can get them online. Um, when you're buying at car boot sales there's not a lot of risk because the pieces come in for nothing. This piece came in for a few pounds the other day. This one I paid a fiver off a dealer for two reasons. One, I wasn't 100% on it myself until I got it out in the daylight and had a proper look. And two, once I realised what it was, I wanted to make the video anyway, so it was worth the money. Um, so I could show you where somebody's copying the manner or the style of white fryers. They got the colour right, they got the bubbles and everything, but there's still no white fryers. So, I hope you've enjoyed the uh, video. If you did, put a like. Uh, I'd love uh, for you to share the video. Um, you'll find us on Facebook, Antiques Arena. We have our own website, antiquesarena.co.uk, and we're on eBay where we sell half of our stock, Antiques Arena Clearance. Thanks for watching, guys. I really hope I've uh, helped. Bye for now.